We begin this day of our novena by reciting the novena prayer to St. Peregrine. O great St. Peregrine, you have been called the wonder worker because of the numerous miracles which you have obtained from God for those who have had recourse to you. For so many years you bore in your own flesh the debilitating disease of cancer. I seek God's healing. Help me to imitate your enduring faith in the face of my great challenge that I may trust the Lord as you did in your time of affliction. Help me to find the strength to proclaim God's presence in my life, despite the anguish and fear this disease causes in me and my loved ones. O glorious St. Peregrine, Aided in this way by your powerful intercession, I will sing to God now and for all eternity a song of gratitude for his great goodness and mercy. Amen. I remember the last time I saw my mother alive. It was a cold November evening 54 years ago. I had come home from school bursting to tell her that I had scored a try at rugby. Well, rugby, as you probably know, is something similar to football in the U.S., except with fewer players and no armor plating. Now, my mother had been ill for some time. Well, as people do, and maybe as children do, I knew this, but I always thought she would get better. I didn't see the gradual decline that had intensified over the previous weeks. And I thought that the nurse who came every day and who was a member of our parish was giving her injections to make her better. I knew nothing about morphine then. So on this particular evening, I rushed into our living room, and by this time my mother was too ill to go upstairs. And I saw her being held up by one of our neighbors who had been looking after her. And her hands were joined as in prayer, and as I looked in her face, I could see that she was almost gone for us for the first time I knew what was happening. So the shock was very great for a 13-year-old boy. So I saw that she was slipping away and was passing through the thin veil that separates time and eternity. And that was the first time in my life I had ever experienced the bitterness of loss. And in the hours that pass, I thought of the things that would never be again for me. Maybe it was a form of selfishness. I'd no longer be able to tell her of my sporting and academic triumphs and see her quiet smile of pride. I would no longer have her to encourage me in my disappointments and failures. She wouldn't be there to point out in a gentle way my own acts of selfishness or self-protectiveness. So I thought... It will be harder to be good. As always happens, the intensity of those first days and months fade, but there were times when that sense of loss came back with a melancholy power. Other boys had their mothers supporting them at school prize givings or award giving or for graduation or even for ordination to the priesthood. I didn't. So children who lose their parents have much longer to grieve. Now, love is a fundamental element in our human existence. Virgil, the classical Roman poet, begins his great work on the Trojan War and the foundation of Rome, saying he's going to write of the tears of things and the mortal things that touch the mind. The Irish poet W.B. Yeats has a similar phrase in his poem, The Stolen Child. Come away, O human child, to the water and the wild, for the world is more full of weeping than you can understand. Now, the existence of human sickness and suffering is a challenge to our minds and wounds our hearts. St. Thomas Aquinas, in his Summa, accepts only two serious objections to the existence of God. First one, you could argue there is no need for a supreme being. And secondly, that the fact of evil is difficult to reconcile with the existence of an all-loving God. So these are the objections he counters. 
Now, if we're honest, we all struggle with, the honest, with that second objection when we're faced with the deaths or suffering of those we love, apparently irrational slaughter in our schools, the challenge of personal sickness and disability. We feel that some evil has passed upon us or has been imposed on us. And the classical reflection on all of this is that evil is an absence of something. When we talk about a bad illness, we're really talking about the absence of good health. So loss or absence is built into the fabric of creation. And when did it become a bitter reality for humanity? In terms of classical theology, sickness and death began in the garden when Adam and Eve attempted to become their own creators to organize the world around themselves. Instead of receiving the gift of immortality, they grasped at eternity and omniscience. The consequence of this was loss expressed in terms of exile. So since then, our lives have been marked by a profound nostalgia for what we have lost. Most of the time, we don't realize what we've lost, and we search to ease the absence with the ephemeral and the transient. Paradoxically, all of the modern attempts at self anesthetization through addiction, for example, are an implicit recognition that life and human existence should not be like this. There's a deficiency in the world of relationships and in the makeup of our own humanity, which was not in the original design. So instead of confronting that loss, we flee from it into the artificial paradises of our own creation. And what we've lost is that intimate life with God that's so touchingly described in the book of Genesis. There's a tendency within humanity to become less than we were created to be. So the deformed and disfigured humanity resulting from the fall is precisely that of fall downwards. Now in the garden, God gives humanity, he gives Adam the noble task of naming all of the animals. Well, naming something or somebody is a sign of lordship. So Adam is given authority as the steward of creation to act for God, to regulate and govern the animal creation. But what happens? Instead, he puts himself under the domination of Satan, who is by tradition a talking serpent. This is not how it was meant to be. The order is inverted. The order placed in creation by God is inverted. And one of the consequences for Adam is grief and loss. He didn't know it before then. And a prolonged nostalgia for what once was and can only be again after a long period of education, pedagogy, in which humanity learns to accept the loss and to hope for its healing. There's a beautiful hymn in the Byzantine liturgical tradition that describes Adam after the fall. He is outside the closed gates of paradise, weeping. Adam sat before paradise and lamenting his nakedness he wept. Woe is me! By evil deceit was I persuaded and led astray. And now I am an exile from glory. Woe is me! In my simplicity I was stripped naked, and now I am in want. O paradise, no more shall I take pleasure in thy joy. No more shall I look upon the Lord my God and maker, for I shall return to the earth whence I was taken. O merciful and compassionate Lord, to thee I cry aloud, I am fallen, have mercy on me. So the picture is of a desolate Adam who suddenly realized the extent of his own loss and what it's cost. And he's now moved by an overwhelming desire to return, but he knows not the way. Genesis tells us that God originally placed, or literally planted, Adam in the garden. Adam was meant to be then rooted in that place. In other words, we were meant for stability and intimate friendship with God. And our present state is that of wanderers, or more properly, pilgrims. A pilgrim isn't one who travels aimlessly, but one who has a definite destination even though he's not quite sure what it is until he gets there. When Abraham was ordered to leave his land, his people, and his father's house, he was told that God would show him the land that he was bound for. But he would only know it when he arrived. So what drives Abraham and what urges us too is desire. The journey is itself pedagogical, a form of catechesis. We're learning how to be at home with the Lord through being taught what we really love and long for, 
but allowing him to uncover it within us. I think it was Dr. Johnson, the 18th century English writer, who said, although I've I've never been able to find it again, that there was no point in going on pilgrimage since a person only found at journey's end what he had brought with him. And in many ways, this is true. We don't go on pilgrimage to find God at our destination, but the journey itself teaches us that he has been with us every step of the way, but we have not felt his presence. Some years ago, a well-known Scottish Jesuit walked from England to Rome. He called his best-selling account of the journey in search of a way. And we often think that this is the fundamental dynamic of our own existence. We are searchers or explorers, seeking meaning, seeking fulfillment, seeking peace, seeking happiness and seeking love. We are seekers. The American country music singer Johnny Lee wrote a best-selling single that remained at the top of the U.S. charts for three weeks, which is in itself a tribute to its resonance with many people. It was called Looking for Love. Well, I've spent a lifetime looking for you, singles, bars, and good-time lovers were never true. Playing in a fool's game, hoping to win, and telling those sweet lies and losing again. I was looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces, searching their eyes and looking for traces of what I'm dreaming of, hoping to find a friend and a lover. I bless the day I discover another heart looking for love. So he was looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many places. It's a parable of disappointments, reflecting many people's experience that they are trapped in some kind of fatalistic whirlpool of wrong choices and failed new beginnings. And the sense of failure drives the search. We're in search of a way. And what the scriptures tell us is that the way finds us. We don't find it. We must just allow ourselves to be found. Every road has a beginning and an end. And the end of this road is, in fact, our beginning. In County Meath in Ireland, there's an ancient Neolithic monument at a place called Newdrange. And it was built with great skill and intelligence about 5,000 years ago. So it's older than the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt and Stonehenge in England. It's older than Ur, Babylon and Knossos, which had not even begun when it was constructed. So it's a mound of earth piled on top of an elaborately structured chamber with a gradually rising passage leading to it. Nobody knows for certain what the purpose of this monument was. It seems to have been part tomb and part temple. And one mysterious feature gives us some kind of idea why so much time, effort and ingenuity were invested in its construction. The passage to the centre of the tomb is so orientated that on the 21st of December, in the depths of winter, on the shortest day and at the darkest time of the year, when the year is turning, A beam from the noonday sun travels along the passage to the tomb chamber before striking into the very heart of darkness. So the light entered not through the door, which was sealed with a five-ton slab of stone, but through a window above the door with a shutter that could be slid back and forth. So on the day of the solstice, the shutter was opened, but no one entered the tomb or followed the course of the sun's rays as they made their slow progress into this lifeless place. And if there were any worshippers attending this ancient liturgy, they remained outside, cut off by the stone, blocking the entrance of the tomb. And When the women came to the tomb, they asked, who will roll away the stone for us? Yet it was also a testimony to that desire for eternal life which lies within each one of us, planted there at our conception by the living God who made us for himself. So every year at the point when the earth was dying and returning to life, the Neolithic pilgrims made their way to Newgrange to confront the immovable stone at the door of the tomb. They were making that same pilgrimage which is the story of humanity without the promise of resurrection. We are the only creatures who are conscious of mortality. We are the only ones who know that one day we will die. And the manner and time of our departure from this world is in God's merciful providence hidden from us. But we know that it come, it will. And there are many of our contemporaries who believe that the road on which we are embarked leads to that sealed door. There is nothing beyond it. We're in the Gospel of Matthew, we read that very early on the morning, after the Sabbath, as light and dark struggled to give birth to a new day, the women made their way to the tomb of the dead Messiah, who will roll away the stone for us. 
And they were following that road that every human since Adam has followed, the road to the sepulchre. And they weren't expecting that Jesus' fate would be different to any other human destiny. Their intention was to anoint the body, to preserve it, and to keep it from the decay and decomposition that they presumed to be our inevitable fate. They had a particular worry. Who would roll away the stone? Who would unveil this darkness so that the light of the sun would pierce its gloom? Who would let the light of our world fall on the obscurity of this realm of non-being? But this tomb is a strange place. Light from our world does not fall on it, illuminating it. Light shines from it. So the sad procession of women who make their way to the tomb are acting out what has been the presumed fate of humanity since the fall, when the peace and communion that reigned in the Garden of Eden was broken. They're making an exodus pilgrimage, but ironically not to a place of presence, but to the site of a disappearance. They're in search of something or somebody who can only be disclosed to them when he finds them once more. The 17th century French writer and philosopher Blaise Pascal in one of his writings has God say, you would not be seeking for me if you had not already found me. In fact, you could reverse that and say we would not be seeking him unless he had already in some sense found us. It's always God who takes the initiative. In the Christian vocation, receiving comes before acting. So what the promised land was to the people of Israel, the reconstitution of that original space of harmony and peace between the bridegroom and God and his spouse, Israel, now reaches its fulfillment in the glorified body of the risen Christ, of which we are to become members. So this is where the pilgrimage of the elect has been leading since the garden gates of Eden were shut fast against fallen humanity and Adam and Eve were made into wanderers by God. It was God who found Abraham in his domestic security and stability in Haran. It was God who found Moses in his exile in Sinai. God who raised up Elijah and Jeremiah to warn the people that they had fallen far from their destiny, wandered from their vocation. And finally, it was God who sent his only begotten Son, speaking definitively to all people, and showing them in his flesh the goal of their journey and the purpose of their existence. Now in the midst of all this, we can see that these chosen ones focus the vocation of the entire people. They focus our vocation. It's not that they have the vocation and others are the spectators. They become, in a sense, the sacramental sign of the election of all. Now the British scripture scholar N.T. Wright who's written about the significance of the ascension of the Lord, says, when we think about the ascension, we often imagine that it involves the departure of the glorified Christ from the earth. It's his departure from us that makes our search for him inevitable and necessary. And what the early Christians thought was that the ascended Christ actually meant that all is ruled through him. Many people will say, if Jesus is in charge, why is the world still such a mess and seeming to get worse every day? Well, the early church didn't believe that. Their world was not a mess. Well, they didn't believe that their world was not a mess. But that a new CEO had taken charge. His new way of governing things was being worked out in the way that he had lived, in suffering, vulnerability, in praise, in being misjudged, in being vindicated, and in being celebrated. Now that brings us close to the point where we started. How can we make sense of sickness and death? If the Lord came to give us life, and so that we might have it more abundantly, where is it? Well, part of the answer lies in our own experience of these two realities, sickness and death. We have a deep awareness that though inevitable, they are not welcome. Things were not meant to be so. They inhibit and reduce our humanity. But what vision of humanity do we operate with? What is it to be truly human? The answer is to be like Christ. Karl Barth, the great 20th century theologian, once wrote, In the existence of the man Jesus, we have to do with the true and normal form of human nature, and therefore with authentically human life. He is the true and normal form of human nature. He is the end of our journey, but it is also the way that we follow to that end. And when we are sick or disabled in some way, we have an image of what the fullness of life might be for us. We have a vision of what it might mean to regain our health. 
In the Christian life, this is how we regain our health, our salvation. We don't argue up from our own experience to what it is to be human. We receive that image from beyond our own world. It's projected from the sphere of God into our disordered world. And such is the extent of the disorder that we find it difficult to accept. We've got used to our infirmity and found a certain security and comfort in it, limited and confined as it may be. Well, some years ago, I had an operation on my knee. It was a long procedure. And subsequently, I was in a lot of pain and discomfort. And the day after the surgery, when I was lying in bed in the hospital, feeling exceedingly sorry for myself, feeling fragile and bruised, a bright, attractive young girl bounced up to my bed and said, Good morning, Father. I have come to help you. I thought, at last, somebody's come to help me. That's what I need. I didn't realize the kind of help she was going to offer me. I said, help me? I said in a quizzical voice. She said, yes. Now, you just sit up and get out of bed. I said, wait a minute. Must be some mistake. <laughs> I've just had serious surgery, and I'm not ready for this, you know. She was, of course, a physical therapist. And she told me, if you don't start trying to move now, your joints will stiffen up you'll lose muscle tone, you'll not regain flexibility in your knee, your walking will be impaired, and life will contract for you. You'll have a narrower life, a narrower range of possibilities. So, I got up out of the bed. Boy, did it hurt. And then she, started, I, she made me start to walk. And after a few steps, I thought to myself, this is too much, this is too painful. I don't care if life contracts. I don't care if I lose muscle tone. I don't care if I lose some mobility. This is difficult, too difficult. Let me go back to bed. Well, she was, of course, quite ruthless. And she forced me to continue. She wouldn't let me stop. And she was right. Despite the pain and discomfort, I did regain movement. And I was able to function more or less normally in a short time. Now, in a way, our journey to wholeness and to healing is like that. It's hard for us to walk the road of goodness and virtue. We have to do good in order to become good. It takes practice. Now, in Mark's Gospel, when the scribes and Pharisees are complaining about Jesus mixing with tax collectors and sinners, he replies, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So Jesus compares himself to a doctor. His ministry is fundamentally a healing ministry. That's what salvation means. As we profess in the creed, who for us and for our salvation, our healing, he came down from heaven. Salvation sounds to be a very theological and spiritual term, but it means healing. Our earthly journey is essentially a healing pilgrimage. And through it, we're being led to that more abundant life that he promised us. The deficiencies in our damaged humanity are being remedied and restored. As one of the Easter office hymns has it, his body did redeem our loss. Our loss is repaired through his body, of which we are all members, living with his life and sharing in his mission to be healers and reconcilers. So let us stand and pray the prayer to St. Jude Thaddeus. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the Church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you, to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, a blessed Jew, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen.